In part one of this series, we looked at the overall scale of Russian defenses in Ukraine, compared their nature to other historical fortifications, and ultimately simulated a small section of the battlefield to bring them to life. This showed the incredibly difficult task ahead for an attacking army. Having now established the fortifications, let us see what it will take to defeat them. From the basic game theory of attack and defense, to the strategic level maneuvers the war planners will have to consider, and finally, the five breaching tenets which must be mastered by the troops and their officers on the ground. This is the playbook for defeating Russia's defenses in Ukraine. So I've been looking to upgrade my office for quite a while now, and while I was looking for products, I was actually happy to hear that one of my top choices, FlexiSpot, reached out and wanted to actually sponsor us. Now, this is a natural integration. I really appreciate them because they were top scorers for me in terms of price points, aesthetic, ergonomics, and comfort. And to show you why that's the case, let me walk you through what my particular setup looks like. So this is gonna be the C7 Pro standing desk, and it's got a lot of features that I appreciate. First and foremost is gonna be just the C shape. So as you can see in the side, it means that the legs are tucked away in the back, which makes them less visible. I think that's more aesthetically pleasing, and it means I have more leg room, more desktop room, and more room for my dog. Now, you might start to wonder that this offset leg might compromise the structural stability, but I can confirm that it is not the case. I've sat on this thing, and you can put up to 400 pounds and it will not budge. So, it's robust, it's aesthetic, and as you can see at the top, there's plenty of room for you to put whatever you need on your desk. I chose the particular wood finish that you can see here that looks really phenomenal, but you can customize all kinds of stuff. What type of top you want, you can change the legs, the color, and you can also add all sorts of accessories. Let me walk you through these because I really like them. The first one is gonna be this super easy to install, super easy to deploy uh, drawer. And then in the back, what I also upgraded was another cable tray to help me manage my wires because I'm a mess and I easily form rat's tails. And then what you have over here is a little sleek control panel. Now it functions really, really nicely, super buttery smooth, very, very quiet, and it has a lot of features built into it. One is the child lock, the other is preset positions, a USB, and then my personal favorite is the fact that it has clash detection. So I have all sorts of stuff on top of my desktop, and I'll admit, sometimes I forget it's there. And so what I'll do is that while I'm working, sometimes I'll drop my desk, and with most models on the line, you know, in the marketplace, I would have crushed my stuff. Not so with FlexiSpot, it knows that the stuff is there and it will actually halt its descent. So that to me is really awesome. And this speaks to the overall design philosophy behind what FlexiSpot offers. So definitely I recommend this particular desk setup, but if you wanna check out any of their other office stuff, definitely do it by clicking the link below. Use the Invicta code for $30 off and keep in mind that any purchases you make through FlexiSpot gets a cut of the proceeds to support the channel. So definitely check them out and I can't recommend it enough. Enjoy. Before we begin, it will be important to note that the fog of war hangs heavily upon the war in Ukraine, and will continue to do so for many years to come. It will be impossible to make a proper assessment of conditions on the ground today, and thus any attempts to play the role of armchair general using definitive statements are inappropriate. That is not the purpose of our video. Rather, we shall be seeking to describe how general principles of modern breaching operations might be applied to the Russian defenses. In doing so, we will use relevant examples from the past to ground our understanding whilst noting important differences in such inevitably anachronistic comparisons. Since after all, it would be just as inappropriate to analyze the wars of today with the facts of the past. This should make it clear that we have a balancing act on our hands. Please keep this in mind as we proceed with the video. Strategic Moves in Theory we can begin with a macro-level view of an attack on Russia's defenses. After all, it is at this strategic level that war planners must consider how to defeat their foe, and it is at this level that modern wars are most often won or lost. We should note that there are entire fields of study dedicated to this subject, but comprehensively covering this topic is beyond the scope of our video. As such, we will have to make do with a simplified explanation. One way to look at things is by applying game theory to the basic ideas of military attack and defense. This topic is well explained by the work of the late Professor Robert Powell, which shall serve as the basis of our discussion. Let's talk through an example. 
In an abstract wargaming sense, we might consider a blue team attack on a red team defense. While both might make their plans simultaneously, generally it is the defender which has to commit at least some of its resources first, and the attacker who then decides where to strike. Here both sides have private information about their understanding of the situation, namely what resources they currently have, what their likelihood of success is on a given front, and what effectiveness of spending resources on said fronts will be. For this first game, let's assume there is no fog of war in these matters. Given our assumption of a sequential turn order, Red Team will go first. They know that Front A is actually quite vulnerable. Fearing this, Red Team chooses to spend resources on its defense, thus reducing their expected losses in the event of an attack and raising their probability of success. On the other side, Blue Team has observed this move and recalculates its probabilities for success. Their incentive is to choose to attack at the location with the highest perceived chance of victory. Given the current state of play, that now means mobilizing against Front C. But now, Red Team realizes that this is their weakest point and allocates resources to counter an anticipated attack. Because Blue Team is ultimately the one to decide when and where they want to start the offensive, they now reconsider their assault on Front C, take another look at the board, and shift to attack the current weak link, Front B. Red Team may then react accordingly. Given enough turns, this back and forth will continue until some equilibrium point is reached. Thus we see how in a scenario where both sides have perfect, symmetrical understandings of the situation, it was always in Red Team's best interest to actually allocate its resources across all fronts until the probabilities of success were equalized. But reality is far messier than this. Even in our simplified scenario, we see how the game becomes more complicated when the fog of war is introduced and either side has limited or incorrect information. Perhaps Red Team believes that they have equalized the odds, but reality looks more like this, and they have a fatal Achilles heel. Or perhaps Blue Team thinks that they have located such a weak point and attack a position with the odds more like this, resulting in disproportionate losses or outright defeat. More complexity can be added to our game by allowing both sides to move simultaneously or by increasing the number of fronts or by increasing the levels of randomness. A truly cruel game designer could keep adding such variables until things become entirely unmanageable. Now realize that this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to simulating the chaos of a real war. Hopefully, this makes it clear how incredibly complex the dynamics are at play for the war planners on both sides of the Ukrainian conflict. Strategic Moves in Practice So with this in mind, let's bring it all back to our original premise of how one might attempt to breach the Russian defenses at a strategic level. The first point to make is that information is key, both in terms of revealing the hand of your foe and concealing your own. Admittedly, this has been true for the entire history of warfare. However, more recently, the scale of modern conflicts and the accessibility of information have meant that it is nearly impossible to move about completely unseen in the fog of war. Operation Bodyguard in World War II is a great example of the caliber of stratagems which were needed to deceive the Germans about Allied plans for the invasion of Europe. This involved everything from creating fictitious armies, to faking operations, leaking false information, and more. In the Ukrainian war, we must imagine that such levels of subterfuge will also be necessary for an attacker to attain victory. Another important strategic imperative for the attacker will be to disrupt the enemy. While such operations might be launched at the frontline forces, often a prime target will be their support and logistical networks to the rear. Doing so will often indirectly soften the defenses and make the allocation of resources by the defenders more difficult. We see this already in Ukraine with attacks on key roads, bridges, railways, material depots, air bases, artillery positions, and more. These might be achieved by way of saboteurs, but such operations are risky and limited in their reach. More commonly, artillery, missiles, and drones are used, but even these have limitations in range and effectiveness. It is for this reason that there has been so much talk of the Attackums, Storm Shadow, and other systems which would increase the effectiveness of Ukraine's disruptive capabilities. Another important strategic move will be to fix an enemy in place. The purpose is simple. Force the defender to allocate resources away from the ultimate point of decisive operation. This might be done by threatening, 
faking, or actually carrying out diversionary attacks. The emergence of anti-Putin militias such as the Legion of Free Russia and the Russian Volunteer Corps with their cross-border raids on Belgorod are recent examples of how small fires can force Russia to redeploy men and material away from the active front. Another example of a larger scale diversionary attack may have been the 2022 Kherson Offensive in southern Ukraine which opened the door to rapid advances in the north in the successive Kharkiv Offensive. But distinguishing primary versus diversionary attacks can be difficult in real time and even in hindsight. Surely they are taking place in Ukraine's counteroffensive, but identifying them now is a fool's errand. Even if an attack was confirmed to be a diversion, it could very well turn into a breakthrough, while conversely, a real attack could ultimately stall out and open up opportunities elsewhere. We simply can't know. This brings up one final strategic consideration, the use of reserves. Given all the uncertainties we have mentioned, holding forces back during an offensive is of utmost importance. Not only will they be required to react dynamically to opportunities as they present themselves, but they will also be needed to seize the initiative and follow through. It is for this reason that the bulk of Ukraine's offensive forces have reportedly yet to be committed as of the time of this video's production. Beyond these considerations, there are many, many more strategic moves we could discuss. For now, it will suffice to say that a broad and coordinated strategy will be needed in Ukraine to ultimately shape the conditions of war which will maximize the chances of breaking through Russia's defenses. But even under perfect conditions, that battle must ultimately still be fought. Now, let us finally zoom in to see how this might be achieved on our previously simulated sector of the defensive line east of Bakhmut. Breaching Tenets The dilemma for the attacker is clear. Ukrainians attacking a line like this will have to punch through defenses over a kilometer deep. They must remove dragon's teeth, bridge or fill in anti-tank ditches, clear a path through hidden minefields, and root out Russian infantry and armor from dug-in positions. A distance that might take 15 minutes to walk could take hours, weeks, or months of agonizing fighting. Further down the road, more strong points await, ready to demand the same price. And even if the Ukrainians do make a breakthrough, Russian doctrine calls for an active defense with counterattacks by mechanized reserves backed by artillery. In practice, Russian tactical coordination has at times left something to be desired, but a fragile Ukrainian foothold will still be vulnerable. To provide one possible guideline for successful offensive actions, we will present the US Army's five breaching tenets, which succinctly list the fundamentals for breaking through such field fortifications. Let us go through each of these in turn while keeping in mind the vital lessons written in blood from past conflicts. After all, although technology and doctrine have changed, the fundamental challenges of attacking a fortified enemy have not. Tenet 1. Intelligence The attacking commander must gather relevant information and integrate it into his battle plan. Finding weaknesses in enemy defenses is critical, as is finding the location and capabilities of enemy forces. In our example, the Ukrainian commander will want to ascertain the position and strength of Russian obstacles and strongpoints. The position of key systems, like any dug-in tanks, will be of special interest. For over a century, the preferred tools for pre-breach reconnaissance have been air flight. In Ukraine, small off-the-shelf drones have become a novel eye in the sky. In the past though, commanders would have used manned aircraft for similar purposes. For instance, as Allied armies confronted the Hindenburg Line in 1917, Commanders on both sides turned to a then novel tool, the airplane. While the aces are the best remembered part of the great war in the air, the most important flyers had another duty. Working primitive cameras and radios, they photographed enemy defenses and did the all-important job of hunting down enemy artillery. It was dangerous work. The Royal Flying Corps' struggle to maintain air supremacy during the Battle of Arras in 1917 would lead to Bloody April, a costly victory that took the lives of over 200 airmen. New pilots only lasted an average of 11 days before being shot down. In today's conflict, the Ukrainians are critically lacking when it comes to air superiority. However, for intelligence gathering, they have the advantage of orbital satellite imagery and low-altitude drones. While the former operates at a safe distance from the battlefield, the latter does not. Most scout drones suffer high casualties, lasting only a few missions. But now, thanks to unmanned technology, their pilots can live to fight another day. Yet we should note that this ease of battlefield intelligence cuts both ways. In this war, the Russians can just as easily spy on the Ukrainians for a dynamic and responsive defense. 
Tenet 2, Breaching Fundamentals In current U.S. Army doctrine, commanders must make a plan abbreviated as follows. Suppress enemy positions, obscure the reduction point, secure the point, reduce the obstacles at the point, and assault the positions behind it. During the Second Battle of El Alamein in October to November of 1942, the British-led Allied forces illustrated the difficulty of completing these tasks. Suppression would be done largely by artillery. On the night of October 23rd, over 450 guns fired non-stop for approximately five and a half hours, consuming nearly a thousand tons of ammunition per hour. The British also attacked in the electronic domain using specially equipped Wellington bombers to jam access radio networks. Ideally, a modern force would rely on air or naval support, as has been the case with many recent operations by American forces. However, the Ukrainians are lacking in both departments, and thus must largely rely on land-based artillery, mortars, and missiles. It is for this reason that they are reportedly consuming huge amounts of these resources and are requesting significantly more from their allies. As for obscuration at El Alamein, the cover of night provided most of the discretion needed to creep into no man's land. Although, some units also made limited use of smoke screens to mask advances during the daytime. In Ukraine, both approaches might be used, with the added dynamic of either side potentially employing night vision or heat detection technology to cut through such obscuration. Unfortunately, security for the breaching force at El Alamein was a task largely neglected by the attackers. Columns of infantry and tanks moving towards the breach often paid in blood when they came under fire from Axis defenders. This has proven to be equally difficult in Ukraine, where columns of vehicles have found themselves dangerously exposed while advancing unsupported. As for reduction of the vast minefields at El Alamein, this fell to the engineers. As New Zealander Bernard Freyberg remarked on the eve of battle, quote, a terrible lot depends on the sappers. They located and cleared mines with newly developed Matilda Scorpion flail tanks and metal detectors, but shortages of this key equipment meant that many sappers were reduced to probing with bayonets and sweaty hands. Once a lane in the minefield was clear, they marked it with some of the 130 miles of white tape and 80,000 lamps allocated for this purpose. In Ukraine, there are numerous options available for reduction efforts. This includes the use of specialized vehicles, line charges, or cluster munitions. Such tools are extremely important, as it has been reported that one of the leading causes of Ukrainian casualties are these mines. Not only do they exist in extremely dense belts, but any areas which have been cleared can easily be re-mined if the location is not secured in a timely manner. Thus we see how a breaching operation might easily fall into stagnation. Looking back at the Second Battle of El Alamein, the assault on the Axis position took over 20 days to achieve victory. A relatively quick affair in the grand scheme of things, but also a quite costly one in terms of men and materials. The Allies of 1942 struggled with many of the same challenges facing the Ukrainians of 2023. Shortages of key equipment, limited manpower, and a lack of experience with combined arms. It is this last point which we shall now discuss. Tenet 3. Breaching Organization Breaching operations are a team effort. Tasks in the assault are usually divided among different teams who successfully execute support, breach, and assault tasks. These teams must be combined arms teams with tankers, infantrymen, engineers, artillerymen, and other specialists working together. Creating the three teams often requires commanders to task organize, temporarily breaking up existing units and mixing and matching their components to create new teams. The U.S. Army officers assaulting the Siegfried Line in late 1944 and early 1945 demonstrated this concept. Infantry companies were reinforced by engineers and a platoon of tanks or tank destroyers. In turn, infantry platoons were broken into smaller assault teams equipped with bazookas, flamethrowers, demolition charges, and extra BARs. One official history describes how teams from the 45th Infantry Division went into action in March 1945. Quote, Advanced troops passed through the outer ring of Dragon's Teeth and, supported by a company of medium tanks, assaulted the pillboxes and bunkers. Tanks move up to the Dragon's Teeth and directed fire upon the pillboxes. The infantry and demolition teams from the engineers then blew a path for vehicles to move through. 
Based on recent reporting, it seems that the relatively green Ukrainian troops have understandably struggled to pull off the same level of breaching operations that might be expected from the likes of their NATO trainers. Some anecdotal examples from the field include reports that, quote, units failed to follow cleared paths and ran into mines, or that, quote, when a unit delayed a nighttime attack, an accompanying artillery bombardment to cover its advance went ahead as scheduled, tipping off the Russians. But this sort of thing always takes time, and experience is undeniably the best teacher. Tenet 4. Mass. As modern doctrine says, quote, Breaching is conducted by rapidly applying concentrated efforts at a point to reduce the obstacles and penetrate the defense. Mass combat power is directed against the enemy's weaknesses. To apply this to our situation, to take the defenses manned by a Russian company and a single tank, the Ukrainians might have to commit a company of mechanized infantry in Bradleys, a tank company of Leopard 2s, a platoon of combat engineers, and a battery of howitzers. Critically, mass has to be achieved at every level of breaching operation, one reason why breaching operations have historically been so manpower intensive. On the Hindenburg Line in 1917-1918, for instance, British attackers sometimes had to commit an entire 36-man platoon to neutralize a four-man German machine gun pillbox. At the operational level, the commitments are even greater. When the 8th Army attacked at El Alamein 25 years later, it marshaled 1,038 tanks, 1,403 anti-tank guns, 884 pieces of artillery, and 195,000 men. In all such cases, attacking into the teeth of prepared defenses causes heavy casualties and wears down the lead units, so reserves and reinforcements are essential for success. Tenet 5. Synchronization As doctrine cautions, quote, Breaching operations require precise synchronization of the breaching fundamentals of support, breach, and assault forces. Failure to synchronize effective suppression and obscuration with obstacle reduction and assault can result in rapid, devastating losses of friendly troops. Historically, commanders have tried to achieve synchronization with two tools, pre-battle planning and battlefield communications. Since World War I, staff officers have prepared elaborate timetables to coordinate artillery barrages, the step-off times of infantry, and dozens of other variables. But as they say, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Communication is critical to help commanders react to an evolving situation and coordinate the combined arms teams. Achieving this communication can require some improvisation. For instance, GIs fighting their way across Europe to the Siegfried Line devised several field expedients to allow buttoned-up tankers to talk to the infantry. One method was to attach a field telephone to the rear of the tank so infantry could ring up the tank crew. Another was to give the tankers a handy talkie radio that could communicate on the infantry's radio net. For more on this, you can actually learn about how American infantry used their critical communications advantage in our true size video on the US rifle companies of World War II. The Chances of Success As we've seen with these tenets, a successful breach of defensive lines is quite the undertaking, even under the best of circumstances. With just a few things going wrong, the nature of battle can quickly slide from one of maneuver to one of attrition. The latter is a path which may still lead to victory, but which will take more time, resources, and effort. Yet while many defensive lines have eventually fallen to relentless, costly onslaughts, others have held. Historical defenders have thrown back many attackers who lack the strength, the tactics, the organization, or the courage to successfully execute complex breaching operations. For instance, the Nivelle Offensive of 1917 failed to breach the Hindenburg Line. Despite new tanks and newly learned tactics, France lost nearly 200,000 men dead and wounded for little gain. At the First Battle of El Alamein in 1942, British mines and empty fuel cans halted Rommel's last great offensive into Egypt, setting the stage for the British offensive at the second El Alamein we've discussed earlier. And at Kursk in 1943, the German offensive was halted by broken panzers, brutal shelling, thick minefields, and dogged Soviet resistance. At the time of this video's production, Ukraine has started to peel back the soft outer lines of Russia's defenses and is beginning its operations to breach their hardened positions. But how will history remember the Ukrainian counteroffensive? That remains to be seen.
What do you think the future holds? Let us know in the comments below and help suggest topics you'd like to see us cover next. Consider supporting us on Patreon for HD downloads of all our art, to participate in polls, and to catch script previews. A huge shout out to all the current patrons for supporting the channel and to the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content, and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.